Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. I am Hody Johns. And I'm Brian Walgamuth. And Aaron V. will be here in just a moment. He's just running a little late, and we wanted to get started. Uh, first things first, this is Enemy of My Enemy, where we represent center, right, and left libertarian values all in the same show. We talk about what we agree, disagree on, and we all end up friends after it's all said and done. Mm -hmm. Just to show you what a good proper disagreement might look like. Uh, so what we want to, well, let me start with something today. I did want to issue an apology uh, to my buddy, Dave Smith. Um, I misquoted him in the last podcast, and I should apologize to you, the listener, as well, because if you tune in, you expect good information, and I gave you bad information, and I don't like giving out bad information. That's not what I'm here for. So I believe the quote I said, he said, um, and uh, well, we're going to get the expletives no matter what we do anyway. So I believe I said, uh, he said trans rights or some shit, and what he said was who care. Uh, who understands that and still gets worked up about transphobia or some shit. Now, the other thing is I didn't really provide any context to that. He is not, I do not believe Dave Smith is a transphobe. Um, and I, I, I haven't changed my mind on that this last week, but I did present it in a way that makes him seem transphobic. So to provide you the full context of the quote, because he noticed it and, correctly took took offense. He said, yeah, and in addition to that, libertarians tend to understand the big problems, war, slavery, theft, etc. Who understands that and still gets worked up about transphobia or some shit? Now, I would still disagree with what Dave is saying here. However, the pretext of a good disagreement is not straw manning somebody, taking the words out of con context or misquoting them. I did that. My apologies, Dave. I know you're listening. Love you, buddy. I just wanted to throw that out there. I do not want to be one of the people that is triggered and says stupid things about the Mises Caucus when they don't know what they're talking about. I I do enjoy Dave a great deal. Um, I disagree with him on these, and I think I, I, I'm not I'm not going to back away in that I think that these types of statements alienate some people that would otherwise be good libertarian allies. However, uh, like I said, that's a disagreement that I can have without misquoting somebody or taking somebody out of context. So I just wanted to lead with that, uh, just as a correction to you and a correction to Dave. Uh, we're going to be talking about war in the Middle East today. Um, so we actually did an episode about this, and unfortunately, it got lost to the cosmos. <laughs> and so uh, we're going to, we felt it was important enough. We were thinking about the news this week, and they're still working on the what's going on with the spending bill and they're still, still working on exactly what the executive orders are going to look like with the guns. And none of those fully manifested enough for us to comment accurately about them. They're, they're speculative at this point. And so what we wanted to do is talk about something that we have definitively. And uh, we figured, Hey, if the, if the war in Syria and the war in the middle East got lost to the cosmos, we should talk about it. So what I've got here is uh, just some, some brief info. Um, on February 25th, uh, 25th America, um, we launched missiles and hit an Iranian target um, with that was uh, occupied by Iraqi military members in Syria. So it's very complicated. There's three countries in there involved already. Um, we did kill 22 people. They were mostly but not all Iraqi military. There were some civilians killed in the attack. Um John Kirby has, uh, we might say, why did we do that? John Kirby called it, uh, he is the uh, Pentagon press secretary. He called it proportionate and defensive. Now, what he is talking about is an attack that was on, um, attack that happened earlier in the month. And it, it was, it injured an Iraqi contractor. I believe it was in Iraq. In fact, I have the map here. It was in Iraq. It injured an Iraqi, or I'm sorry, it injured, it injured an American soldier and killed an Iraqi contractor. Um, and this was a response to that attack. Um, according to uh, Lloyd Austin, he is the defense secretary. You might recognize him as the CEO, uh, former CEO of Raytheon. He, of course, has, uh, he still owns stocks there. So he has as libertarians warn you, he has direct incentive to be blowing people up and be using bombs and making them look useful. Uh, so that's that's obviously an issue we have to get into. I did want to say this because there are two new developments since we just talked about that issue alone. 
Um, the first was according to, uh, in fact, Biden has even given a speech about it. But we have we are apparently pulling out of Iraq by or um, Afghanistan by September 11th. Um, this was an agreement done by Donald Trump, and the agreement was to pull out in May. Joe Biden said we don't feel we can honor that, but he does feel we can honor it and pull out by September 11th. And then the other wrinkle to this is May 4th, we actually had a second strike scheduled, um, but we aborted it when a mother and child were spotted in the area. So that's kind of, uh, that's that's the information that we have so far, just as far as the escalation of violence in the Middle East. Um, Brian, what are your thoughts on that? I, I, I'm, there's a learning moment there in that last sentence. Hey, look, there's a mom and a kid. We're about to put a JDAM right through the kid. Let's, let's maybe not hit the trigger as hard as we used to back in 2001. So I'm happy to hear that. Of course, I would love the JDAM not to be hit, but this gets back to, you know, one thing you talked about, Hody, was proportional response. And proportional responses are great if you just want to keep things the way they are. A proportional response to somebody leave, having your dog poop in their yard is to leave poop in, they take the poop and leave it in their yard. It's not burn the house down. This, that's great. That's what you should do. Proportional response in war kind of makes me sit there and go, do you, do you want this thing over with? Because that should be the, the end result of any war is to get this get it this over with. So whatever disagreement is there, either one side goes, we're gonna kick your butt, and uh, you know, let's just get this over with now, so we don't have to blow up anybody or kill anybody. But that's not been the end goal in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, blah 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 blah. These endless wars keep going. I am a big fan of when you need to do something. You do it, you do it right, you go in, you get it over with, but you have to be very measured. And it's kind of like when we get back here with uh, the, the police shootings, things like that. You've got to make sure, you've got to make sure you're right, and you've got to make sure that you're taking out the right people. Um, if you cannot tell the difference between a group of IED makers and a wedding at 45,000 feet, you probably shouldn't pull the trigger. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear there's a little more trigger control lately, and that should be the front page news. But I also find it funny with Biden sitting there going, oh, it's going to be September 11th. You know, I do project mapping and things like that. You mean, figure out it's going to take this much time to get something complete, get some fudge numbers in there. Did, did it really come up September 11th? Did they really sit there and go, you know what, we need an extra 197 days or whatever that time frame is. And oh my God, it's September 11th. What are the odds? <laughs> no, you don't want this over with on a certain day. You can say it's a goal. Hey, look, you know what, we can't get it. We'd really like to be over by September 11th, but we're going to do it sooner if we can. That's that's the goal of any project. But I got a gut feeling in September 11th, we're going to get a... You know, we tried, and and the problem is that Steve, the, the cook, he does this really wicked lamb kebabs, and unfortunately can't get this lamb anywhere else, so we're going to stay here another few years. Um, so uh, they'll come up with something, and, and it's sad. But until we start voting these people out and getting them out of there, we're going to still sh keep shipping people. And even if they're like, oh, it's only 3,000 people. Um, I want you to go grab 3,000 of your neighbors, ship them over to Afghanistan for six months to a year, have them come back and let me tell me how their experience was. Three decades. Yeah, it's um, as libertarians, obviously, war is bad. War is as close. If you were to name something besides like statism that was the opposite of libertarianism, I think war is pretty close. I mean, it involves a lot of of things that libertarians hate and uh, it, it is to be avoided at all costs. Uh, now I, I, I'm going to caveat that there are legit reasons to go. And I, and I'm, I'm going to say that it is such a narrow, it's kind of like, you know, we had to go in and, and, you know, like going after Osama bin Laden, that's kind of a, he kind of launched an attack on us. We can get into all the end. Oh, you know, these people knew blah, blah, blah. We can get into all of that. Um, but there are, but this whole, now we're going, oh, let's get Saddam Hussein, who's, you know, maybe building a nuke, maybe just saying he's building a nuke, whatever. Right. Maybe just interested in nuclear technology. I don't know. Uh, the, 
That's that's fair. It's to be avoided at most costs. It's to be avoided whenever possible, I guess. It, and it's just yeah. it's it's one of those that I mean, again, this is why we should have congressional approval on these things, which we haven't for a very long time, because you should have most people be able to look at it and say, yes, that's why we now I, I think beyond congressional approval, you should be able to get popular approval, because if you're going to send our people, if you're going to send our kids into war, and you're a politician, it's not really your skin in the game. So you're more likely to vote for war because you actually make the economy look a little bit better. And uh, you you get to create some nationalism and you know all that works well for, yeah, yeah, USA, let's get us, get us reelected. You know, you have incentives to make bad choices. Thomas Sowell was, uh, I love that economist, really good at explaining why politicians make these kinds of decisions. Um, because they are not there to, they they have no incentive to protect you. Historically, they haven't done it. Uh, it might look like protection, but it's not. We will endanger, trust me. We will, it, had we let the attack go, that injured an American soldier and killed an Iraqi contractor, we would have far less terrorism and people and Americans targeted had we let it go. And I'm not even saying we should let it go, but we would have more people safer had we let that go than if we decided to blow up 22 Iraqi people. Get, get this. There's three countries we irritated doing this. It was in Syria. So we yeah. violated their sovereignty. It was an Iranian target that was staffed by Iraqi militia. Which, we, I, we angered three countries at once. We killed some civilians and all those people are going to have anti-American sentiment. Like it, it's just that's we have made ourselves significantly less safe by doing this. I'm, I'm scratching my head on the whole. This is an Iranian base controlled by Iraqi soldiers. That's kind of like having like a a Packer a Green Bay Packer, <laughs> you know, like a party staffed by Chicago Bears fans. You know, it's. It, the Iraqis and, and the Iranians don't get along horribly well. There might be some Shia ones that do, but for the most part, they don't get along great. And the Syrians as well, they don't get along very great with the Iraqis or the Iranians, except for when it comes to money. Um, so it's like, what the heck was going on there? And who decided to pull the trigger on that? Um, yeah, we, we've got 20 families mourning. Uh, we have families mourning on, on all sides of this, and this keeps going and going. And... You know, it's part of the reason why it used to be like in the 90s when it was like, I'll get into the military and, and you know, have a career, learn some stuff and get out. And now it's it's a legit, yeah, you know what, you're going to get shipped somewhere. Uh, and and I have friends that have kids that are in there. I support them. I want them to be safe. I want them to go wherever. I want them to come home and I want them to live absolutely normal lives. I don't want them being, you know, injured mentally or physically uh, over some cliff in rural Afghanistan because that guy's goat looked at us funny. So, you know. I'm going to ask you a question that mm -hmm. I feel you'll be able to get the answer to. Okay. What's the easiest way to not get U.S. troops injured or killed overseas? <laughs> well, we do a great job injuring them here in the U.S. So <laughs> um, by far. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the greatest way is to get them home. There you go. Um, and, and, and I love the whole idea of, well, we need, Con we need contractors or we need, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, advisors. We need advisors over there to help them. And I'm like, you know, we got all these satellites and, you know, the internet's kind of cheap nowadays, not cheap everywhere, but I I'm pretty sure we could probably send them a, a YouTube link on like, you know, Hey, go shoot that way and bang, bang, uh, or fly them over here and, and, and train them. Um, and I have no problems with training, you know, legit government, you know, legit people how to defend themselves but that's where it all gets back to is defending themselves a lot of these villages that um get totally uh populated with uh various groups um you know extremist groups anti-extremist groups anti-anti-extremist groups whatever they want to call it um those group those group families and those are living in terror under one foot or another on their throat so um the libertarian answer to all that is bring them home, please. Stop stop sending them over to get killed. There are going to be legit times that we do need to intervene. There's going to be great times where we can take an aircraft carrier off the coast of 
freaking were mocking me. Remember when the big Sumatra, the, the tsunami and everything, mm-hmm. were mocking Bush for sending an aircraft carrier? And it was like, no, that thing generates so much fresh water. We can make all the water there. We have a hospital. We have all this stuff. We have helicopters that can get the most critical injured, get them treated. I want that. That's the kind of foreign aid I want. That's the kind of stuff I want when something bad happens. We can sail right in. So, of course, say, hey, do you want our help? All right, good. Do our logistics, get in there, get people help. And what happens? They love us then. They go, holy crap. You know, yeah, the Americans came in. They didn't come in with guns blazing. They came in and said, holy crap, he's got a compound fracture of his leg. We got a doc here. <sighs> okay, he can walk again. They, you know, before that was a, you know, well, just put a bullet in his head because the infection is going to kill him in three weeks. It that- makes us so much safer <laughs> by administering aid. Uh, and, and think about this. Think, okay, I, I want to use an analogy. I love sports, so you're going to get a sports analogy out of me. So there are sports here in America. There are sports here over, overseas. And one of the things that leagues overseas do to combat steroids, and and I'm not not that they do everything better in other countries. That's absolutely not not, not true when it comes to sports. But one, but some leagues, what they do is they turn the onus of keeping their players honest onto the teams because what they'll say is, listen, if we catch one of your players who has taken steroids, yeah. we will strip you all the rings from your team. If you win a championship, they're all gone. Who then do you think enforces the rule that you don't mess with? The team is going to be like, no, nobody's taking these. We're going to make sure of it. We're going to be sure we'll call ourselves out. We're going to heavily monitor it because if the league catches us, we can't have this, right? That's not what happens here in America. So think about this. Who would enforce then if like Brian suggested, somebody comes in and gives you fresh water and food to your people that are suffering. If somebody attacks those people, who then is going to enforce it? We don't have to enforce it. No. Their country's going to enforce it. They're going to be like, you attack the people who did what? Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the thing. And actually, the scary thing is this, that there's actually a lot of aid that goes into Afghanistan. There's actually a lot of mm-hmm. good that goes into it. We, When you look at Afghani culture pre-Soviet invasion, when you look at Iranian culture during the Shah, which the Shah, trust me, was a terrible tyrant. But there were some good things going on there, and we can, you know, people say we're after Western culture. No, it was pretty progressive in in Iran and things like that. When those when those countries fell to extremism, we saw what happens, and it's unfortunate, and it's taken them back several years for women's rights, um, you know, gay rights, things like that. I mean, there's this whole list of things that we could sit there and say we really wish you would do this better, but that of course then gets in this whole libertarian perspective of. They've got their own choice, but do they really? Um, but yeah, the, the self-monitoring, the self-policing is the greatest thing that you can do. And that gets down to the individual and the individual's ability to be able to self-police. And that comes with either uh, the ability to defend themselves, the ability to redress government, to get help, and the ability for government to deliver that help. And usually in, in, in what we'll call third world countries, unfortunately, all three of those don't exist. If we were to take half of the military budget and spend it on foreign aid, we would be able to feed, clothe, house, (laughs) give water to every destitute person on earth. We, okay. Yeah. Go go ahead. I mean, so what we're talking about here, and, and here's my thing with that. I'm not, obviously, the libertarian solution isn't to have government do it because believe me, they'd find a way to screw it up. But, yeah. But, that would undoubtedly make us safer. I don't. That, that's not even a question. It's one of those things nobody would debate you on. If you said, let's take half this military budget, because the U.S. military budget, in case you didn't know, is pretty substantial compared to the rest of the world, right? We would be yeah, a little bit. We would be so much safer had we done these things. But instead, what we've elected to do is go in there, bomb and bomb and bomb. Brian brings up a great point. We're talking about, yeah, these people weren't fully progressive. Okay, we set them back because think about what happened in America when we got left alone. Was it a foreign nation that forced us to release our slaves? Was it a foreign nation that made us pass the Civil Rights Act? Was it a foreign nation that said women should be paid equally in the workplace? We're not perfect. Okay, we are progressing. These are things we're getting better on. I'm not going to say we're 100 percent, but I doubt a country coming here and blowing us up until we accepted that 
women deserved equal pay in the workplace was going to make everybody turned on to the idea that women should be paid equal in the workplace. And so what it does is it sets us back. They should be permitted to take the course that we've taken and to say like, hey, we got left alone. We ended up progressing. These bad ideas get filtered out more. And America's not a perfect, believe me, we are not a perfect free market as is. But at least we've been left alone by foreign entities. And even just that, now we'd be much more progressive if the market were free. There's no room. Markets don't allow room for bigotry. I mean, they just, these margins of, to, to if you want to compete in a free market, you need to be looking at fractions of a percent. Like, I mean, 0.01 percentages and stuff like that. So if you turn off 5% of your base because you say something racist, you're dead. You're done. The only way you're going to survive that is if there's some type of coer coercion in place. Well, and I, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Brian. Uh, I mean, it, it, the funny thing is this. This is kind of this weird libertarian spot I always find a lot of us in. You have the right to say whatever you want. That, that that's a fundamental right. You don't have a, you have a right to suffer the consequences of saying what that is, but that's not because from government. The problem is where that line gets crossed, where government comes in and says we are going to inflict these consequences. I you know I'm a big fan of the baker having the right to not bake the cake. I have the right to refuse service to anyone I want. Now should they bake the cake? Yeah, you know what I'd say. I'd say here's the cake. Here's the icing and stuff. You really don't want me to decorate it. It's not going to be my best work. If somebody calls me up and says, I want you to play a country and Western song for a jingle, I'm going to look at them and say, I'm going to suck at it. It's going to be terrible. I have no heart in doing this. You may want to go somewhere else. Here, I'll even sell you the guitar. Go, go for it. Have fun. Um, but that's, that's kind of where this all falls into is the freedom of choice and the freedom to have those consequences. Where I have the problem is when government and groups jump in and say, we are the arbiter of consequences. It's like, no, you, you aren't the arbiter of the consequences. The, the arbiter should be the rest of the market who says, yes, I want to buy for you or no. And it, it always, it's the Streisand effect with all of these. Guess what happens when you get the pizza place up in there? It's like when they were calling around saying, would you bake a pizza for a gamers? And the guy's like, uh, no, I don't know. We really don't do pizzas for weddings. Oh my God, you're a homophobe. Guess what? Like, I got tons of business from all the wrong people for all the wrong reasons. So <laughs> we were looking at, uh, I, I was actually looking at a case of two um, bakeries. One that was that the government stepped in and helped out. And another where they said, yeah, you're free to be homophobes, right? And when, it, when, when they stepped in and said, you can't not bake the cake. Yeah. Um, and so in these bakeries, the one that was forced to stay open ended up getting a ton of business because people came in and, you know, they're like, ha this is hilarious. Look at them. They're forced to make all these cakes, right? right. So these bigots yeah. they managed to profit for these one, for the one that they said, no, they're allowed to, they went out of business within a year. I mean, it's just, people were just, because people's response was gross. Like you said, it's the Streisand effect. Like you think you're owning them, but really you're just playing right into their hands. Right. You know, uh, we've kind of deviated from, from war a little bit. And I'm, I, I'm aware I opened that when I talked about bigotry and progression, but uh, the, the point is, is that these are types of things that the market takes better care of. And we would do, instead of trying to force something down their throat, we would be much better off allowing them to take care of it themselves. There might be something in us. Now, here's the thing. If you are the type of person that wants to say, you know what, I just, I have to intervene. I can't stand to hear about people suffering. I get it. If America was like, hey, that Iger, the, what's going on with the Iger genocide is horrific. What happened in Yemen? I, 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 you're looking at a death toll at like three times the Holocaust. Like, yeah, like we're talking some horrifying events happening in the world. And if America busted in, was like, you know what? Like, like Brian said, maybe this is where our all cost goes. Like, you know what? This is where it goes out the window. Where you can't starve those people to death. We're setting the Igers free. You know, we're not we're not allowing genocide to occur in this world. Okay, right. we're not doing that. No, and we're not okay. going. To. Think we're about not. what we are doing. So here, this is the problem again with an authoritarian force in charge of this, is they don't have the incentive to do it right. And what they do is they say, "You injured one of our guys that we had stationed in your country. Well, we're gonna kill twenty two of your people now. Yeah. You know, like this is, and, and so this is." Why are we there? Why are we not in Yemen? Right? Like, I, you want to take the wind out of a libertarian sails? Fix government. 
That's really what it comes down to. Fix if government was using their abilities to stop Hitler like people that are here in the world today, if they were busting into China and setting the Uyghurs free, if they were feeding the people in Yemen or rescuing them and taking them here, I would have no ground to stand on. I might still believe that government shouldn't have a role to play in the in in the world, but people would be like, "Oh, come on. You're you're I would be the bigot suddenly. I would be an awful person." Oh, yeah. Because I said, you know, like, "Hey, they they should be out." But instead, this is the nature of government. This is what they do. They don't have an incentive to do the right thing. They do the wrong thing. The I I think I've quoted on this show before, but I'll say it again. One of my favorite metrics of all time is that the USSR did produce more food than America. What they didn't have was the incentive to give it to people. And so it rotted away in storage. Their people died in mass. And this is, this is government in a nutshell. The, it can work on paper, right? Like I don't think Keynes was an inherently evil person, but the way he saw it, he was like, oh yeah, we produced the food. You know, we, we'd produce these, we'd keep people employed at all times. We wouldn't go to war. I mean, you know, uh, and Hayek was the one, of course, pointing out, like, people are going to go to war constantly. We'll be in a perpetual state of warfare if we are constantly producing weapons. And he's like, no, people aren't that evil. They're not going to do it. Well, here we are, right? This is this is what we do. We're in a constant state of warfare. We're finding any excuse at all we can use them. I want to point this part out of the story out because here's what bugs me about that second strike that we called off. If the first strike was proportionate, what was the second strike for? Okay. We're, we already know, and Biden's coming out looking like a dove after this, but we already know he's looking to blow up a second target. Yeah. So in response to, you know, yeah. And here's my question. Who made the call to not bomb him? Was it the person sitting there flying the drone or the helicopter that said, I'm not blowing up a mom and a baby. Was it that person who didn't follow an order? Because could you imagine if that shit show happened? Excuse my language. Yeah, I, I, I would have a very hard time pulling a trigger. And I understand that it's a different mentality, chain of command. You're given orders. There's, there's a reason to do it. Sometimes you just have to. But I, I, I would have a hard time pulling a trigger on blowing up a, a mom and her baby, unless that right behind that door that they were standing in had a nuclear weapon that was going to wipe out the entire city or something, you know, then of course, right. and then you go, well, you know, and then at that point, that's a Sophie's choice moment. And I go, yeah, you know, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Um, but I, I would be very interested to find out that that backstory on it. If it was somebody saying, I'm not doing it, or if they've changed the standards, you know, the operating procedures that say, Hey, look, you know, if there's, if this is going to look bad, which it probably will, hopefully, and that's the greatest thing, though. I hope this is happening, is that we are getting more, as we get more connected, we're getting a lot more of this to where people go, this this is going to look terrible. You know, there's going to be a lot of moms on our phones sitting there, oh, look at the little baby. Wham, JDM comes in and blows them up. Um, I hope they're doing that because that's great. That that's That's the exact type of mob kind of social media, you know, that's exactly what we need. We need that to trend so that people will go, you know, what the hell? And, and I don't care if they're, you know, what language you're speaking like that. You can sympathize with anyone who's going to sit there and say, yeah, I'm not. I would love to get somebody on this show that would sit there and say, pull the damn trigger. You got to follow orders. You know, I, I would love that. You know what the thing is? is most libertarians would go, no. And, but that's you're just, supposed to be our right libertarian, Brian. You're supposed to be the one. Saying, that's, that's yeah. the thing most normal people. And just because I'm right wing does not mean I'm like kill them all like God's or I'm out. <laughs> um, and, and I don't think most people are. I think most people get get immune to the numbers. Now, as far as state of war and stuff like that, the scary thing is that as a species percentage wise, things like that, we're kind of at almost our lowest state, even when we sit there and think of the the horrors of what's gone on in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria and things like that. I mean, we lost a good chunk of 57,000 soldiers in Vietnam over a decade. Uh, and, and that was, you know, before that was Korea, which was worse. And before that was World War II, which was worse. And World War I was supposed to be the war to end them all. We, we're still in a cycle. But the one thing I will say about it is that cycle is, is shrinking. And I think it's shrinking mostly because we are now moving towards a more not only interconnected world, but a more capitalist world. Mm -hmm. Capitalist countries generally 
don't like to bomb each other. Number one, it's bad for business. Number two, it's bad for politics. Um, to, to, you know, authoritarian countries like to bomb each other because they're running low on resources and they can do it because, look, I'm uber god, you know, whatever. I'm going to bomb somebody else. Um, the reason North Korea hasn't done it is because I think the Chinese have such a such a uh, shock collar on them. I think if somebody said, you know, we're going to lob a nuke at Japan just because, I, I think that, that the, the entire North Korean government would fall in about 20 minutes. South Korea would be an island very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, but that's the thing, you know, I, I keep looking back at where we were. I Think about this, 40 years ago, or, or 30 years ago, I'm, I'm doing math here, 30 years ago, uh, we were celebrating the fall of the Berlin Wall. I remember doing that when I was in high school and college, my freshman year and stuff like that, and all the things that were going on. Uh, that was the greatest threat to humanity as a whole. And that, you know, and, and people have posted about, you know, these guys are heroes that didn't start, that, that stopped a nuclear war from when they had every right to, they had the orders they were being pressured to, and they stopped the, um, the war from, from taking place. Right. We're getting closer and farther away from that point. Um, there are still single people that can cause all sorts of havoc. But because we're so interconnected, it's much harder to do on a nation state level. It's much easier to do on an individual level, but it's much harder to do on a nation state level. That's what kind of gives me that little bit of hope for humanity. So um, that's why I think that hopefully as, as we keep growing and capitalism keeps flourishing through the world, because it's very hard to find someone who says, I want good old fashioned USSR type socialism. You know, we're going to get it right this time. Y you can find them on the internet, but of course they're the people that are sitting there tweeting that from Starbucks on their iPhone, bitching that the person didn't put enough, you know, uh, uh, flavoring in their latte. You know, it's like, you know, I had a great conversation with a customer of mine who told me about growing up in the Soviet union and um, he avoided really hard labor in the, in the grain mills because he figured out that he knew how to pull a lever to get a ton of, of grain into a truck and get it real close. And he was really good at that. He didn't have to be the guy that stuck his arm in the still on combine to loosen it up. And if you loosened it up wrong and the guy was too drunk and didn't have the brake on, it would rip your arm off. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, it looks like we may be without Aaron for uh, for this podcast. So to represent his lefty views, I, I will say, I will say this: I am still, uh, I am very much a capitalist. I'm very much an Adam Smith capitalist. I'm very much a self ownership capitalist, which can be different from how a lot of times people describe capitalism. So it's for me, I still believe you own yourself, you own the tools for your labor, and you should own the product of your labor as well. Now, that is something that's missing from every country. That's a fantasy, right? Like right now, we're not close to that anyway. Uh, you can call it corporatism or whatever you want, but uh, it, it, literally by definition, it was even a socialist that defined the word capitalism. I love this story because uh, what he did is said, look, they looked out in the fields and they're like, well, who own, owns the head of cows? Capital. You know, the capit referring to the head. So who owns the head of cow? And he called it the, you know, the capitalists would say, you know, the individual owns it, right? You know, whereas others would say other things. And I love that because there was actually a time in capitalism socialist history where the socialists and capitalists weren't actually enemies. In fact, some were good friends. So um, Marx intentionally mislabeled capitalism as this, you know, these, uh, despite how Adam Smith talked poorly about landlordism and uh, you know these predatory practices, Marx labeled it as that. And his fellow socialists, including like Kropotkin, were like, no, 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 no. Like those people are actually kind of close to us here because we believe in individual ownership and not, you know, these, these people, like you need to knock it off. So the reason we have like, the reason we know Marx tried to intentionally mislabel capitalism is because of other socialists that were like, the capitalists are actually kind of our friend. So the reason I bring up this story entirely is because it is important when we discuss these world economies, when we say they're capitalists, they're not capitalists. I think for me, it's less effective to discuss whether capital in us uh, or not to discuss like how much capitalism they have, how much individual, how much free market do they have, you know, versus how much authoritarianism do they have? How much 
big government do they have? And a lot of these countries that, as you mentioned now, this is where I, I will agree with you, the, the bombs are generally flung at countries that are not, that don't have high degrees of free markets, that don't have high degrees of capitalism. Politics in a political sense, they treat it like a zero sum game. And socialists, socialists tend to fall in this trap a lot. Uh, Aaron's not here to defend himself, but uh, I will pose this as, it, it is something we're thinking about that taking the wealth from the rich people does not make poor people richer. It's just historically, say what you want. You can, you can show it on paper. Like, here's my thing. You show it on paper, it might look good, but then you try it, all the rich people leave, and you've got yourself in a real, real quandary here. Now, I'm not obviously if people are making their the wealth by in unethical ends, uh, if, if it means, then it behooves us to do something to fix that problem. People should not be surviving by exploiting workers, and that's kind of where I tend to agree the most with my libertarian socialists on because. Yeah, that's not something we should be doing. That's that's stealing. That's you're taking away their ownership of what what they should have. I generally come at it a very capitalist way in saying the individual should own their stuff, you know, and not the socialist way in saying we should redistribute that stuff to everybody. But I understand that, like, I, I think for me, this is where I can come to. I think this is why this subject unifies so many libertarians is because regardless of where these stand on capitalism or socialism or what these other, like what is happening in these countries is wrong. And it, it, it's more wrong in some of these countries that play it as a zero sum game. The great part about economy is it's not zero sum. You don't have to take it from rich. You can make the poor more wealthy by not taking it from rich people. And, and it's something that these countries don't quite have figured out. Unfortunately, Instead of showing them the light of how that's figured out and allowing them to create wealth and making them more free, we send soldiers that guard checkpoints. We say, you go here. Here's a curfew. Here's, when, who, here's who you're allowed to speak to. Here's who you're not allowed to speak to. These are the places you can go. These are the places you can't. We're going to manage your whole... Okay. And it's like, this, this is, we're doing to them what we, what we know doesn't work, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's it's controlling a populace by the worst means necessary, and the the idea is that we can't take a risk. We can't take a risk of being hit. We can't take a risk of this. We can't take a risk. Of this. So it's better just to take away their freedom, um, as opposed to becoming buds and learning and just like getting back to what we were talking about earlier, which was, you know, showing up and saying, Hey, look, you know, we're going to help you dig a well. We're going to help you with school. We're not going to force anything down your throat. You want to go ahead and uh, don't want us here. No problem. We're going to leave here as quickly as possible. You, you, here's some medicine. Here's, here's some, you know, help if you need food and here's how you get a hold of us. And uh, we're out of here. Have a great day. Watch how fast, you know, people that are going to sit there and say, don't take that food and water because it's evil. Uh, it's like it's like that preacher who sits there and just screams at somebody. You can't take this because this has been polluted by blah, blah, blah. Eventually people are going to go, it doesn't seem too polluted. In fact, oh, yeah. they're going to help us and you're the ones trying to kill us because uh, holding on to your thing. It's great to watch those those things change in, in culture's minds when they suddenly back mm -hmm. off and they go, uh, you know what? Yeah, you guys are full of crap. Um, but getting back to the whole tax thing as well, just this brought this up. I'm sorry, Cody. Um, I was yeah. watching. A, I was watching an interview with Alan Parsons, who is the engineer on Dark Side of the Moon, Alan Parsons Project, blah blah blah. But he talked about how he left England because England in the 70s had a tax rate on the on the wealthy of 83 percent. You want to talk about how rich people leave? Rich people leave. <laughs> and if we think we're going to suddenly be different here in the U.S. because we're awesome, got news here. We're at the pinnacle of, of human travel. It is now very easy for us to buy a plane ticket, go to Bermuda or go to the Caymans, and walk in with a, with a, with a USB drive full of Bitcoin and saying, hi, I'd like to live here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Let me show you to your home, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got to carry all this around. It gets pretty heavy, but if you have this <laughs> USB drive, guess what? Hey, 
I can get that in. I can get that into through the airport. Um, but that's the thing. We just got to stop making terrorists, making people hate us by us bombing because politicians make the easiest and most politically um, astute decision for what they think is it is. Um, you know, again, gets back to Biden picking September 11th. That, that's that's just I, I I I've called that out. I've called that out with other friends and things like that, and they've all said, "Yeah, it's just." I haven't thought about it that way, but that's a very good point. You're doing it to commemorate it for you, as opposed to because it makes tactical sense. Right. If if your goal is to get out there as soon as possible, your goal is to get out there as soon as possible. And if it happens to fall on September 11th, okay. But if I can get it done August 12th, you know. Uh, you know, whatever day can I get it done? It, you know, my my question would be, why can't we meet that May first date? If you tell me why, and, and if you say, well, we're worried about security at this location, can I get everybody else out? I mean, you know, you gotta have a, a supply chain, food stuff, like people at the airport to pick up stuff. Okay, I get that. Can I can I outsource some of this? Can can we get some of this done so we can get out of Afghanistan once and for all? Because I mean, it took the Soviets one decade, it took us two decades figure out things aren't going to change because it's it's a country that's very isolated and wants to be so right you know trump pulled out of that area and it got bombed like the very next day and and i do feel that there's a responsible way yeah we were irresponsible for getting into it to begin with so i do believe there's a responsible way to withdraw (laughs) making that that day that you withdraw a uh (laughs) and of coincide with an event for your political agenda is not the tactful way to do it. Now, like you said, uh, I think that there's a smart way to say like, listen, here's our plans. We're going to leave. Let's turn this over to you. We got plenty of time. Here's what you're going to have to do to make it happen. Um, There's an expert from within the Biden administration who are, has already said, now this all might not happen. Uh, this yeah. is what's announced. Like you said this at the beginning and, and I will give you credit cause I was excited by the news and I, I still am a little bit and I do want to get more into that, but it is, <laughs> it is, it, it doesn't always happen. Uh, Barack Obama signed an executive order to close Guantanamo Bay. That yeah. never happened. It's one of those that, and I think for me that's striking because you know, even as a libertarian, I think that executive orders are terrible because they're absolute and they happen, but they don't always happen. Like they only happen if they want it to happen. Right. And so the the issue is here, we say we're pulling out of Afghanistan, but, you know, we're going to delay it. And then maybe then we'll have a reason to delay it. Maybe they don't have a reason to delay it. The other issue is if we pull out of Afghanistan, are we still going to leave? Well, we have troops in every country in the world. So are we going to still have some troops there? Yes. And are we still going to are those troops coming home or are they going somewhere else? Maybe nearby. And that is far more likely than them coming home. Now I don't want to make this sound like there is no pleasing me because I do want to, I don't uh, libertarians. A lot of times we're just anti, you can't government can't do it right. And when they try to do it right, they do it in the most jackass way possible. And We're right about that 99.9% of the time. We're also probably right about this as well. However, I do want to lend some credence, if it is happening, that this is very important. We can, I can, I would have a hard time explaining. We've had a show on Real Real Libertarians before about the Afghanistan papers. If you don't know what those are, give it a quick Google, read them on Wikipedia. It describes how our last three administrations have all lied about the pe- the civilians we blew up in Afghanistan. And we report a thousand when it's 10,000 and we report terrorists when it's really a wedding. And we, and it's just, it's this terrible, what's happening in Afghanistan is while what's happening in Yemen is killing millions. We're not exactly holier than now because we're killing hundreds of thousands somewhere else. Yeah. And these are not guilty parties in many of these cases. There's a great piece by the New York Times that talks about how conflicted the soldiers are hearing this poll out. On one hand, they're excited to not be in Afghanistan anymore because it's been hellish. On the other hand, and this is what really struck me, I think they uh, they interviewed a ton of people and the overwhelming sentiment was they just said, you know, our biggest regret is we didn't do anything here. We, yeah. we didn't do anything here. We We signed up in the military because we were like, you know, let's go to Afghanistan. Let's do something here. 
let's make this a better place. Let's, let's be a source of healing. Let's, you know, let's be the peacemakers. None of that happened. And I mean, of course, as libertarians, we say no duh, but when you're a kid, and, I mean, I know when I was in high school and it, when I would have first been recruited by the military in college, I certainly had these feelings yeah. that we invade other countries to make it better, you know, to, to, to be the healers in the world, because that's the hype, right? That's what they show in the commercials when I'm watching TV is these, our, our veterans, they go up to these poor people and they're offering them water and food. And you're just like, oh my gosh, I want to be like that. That's what I want to do. I want to be the superhero that shows up and kick these evil Al Qaeda out and kick the Taliban out and 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 get the good people in charge and then leave and everything's going to be great. We didn't do any of that. We didn't do anything. And this is the this is the problem they have and I I feel for them because like I said they probably got recruited when they're young and impressionable and and I, I don't even say like young and stupid because you go with the knowledge that you have. And if the knowledge you have is I saw somebody on a commercial feeding somebody and this is what they promised me then that's what I thought was going to happen. Yeah. And I am really, I, I, I give the same, uh, people might not like it, but I kind of feel the same way about police officers is you end up thinking you're going to be a peacekeeper. And yeah. what ends up happening is you end, turn into a road pirate. And it's, it's, it's one of the, or a murderer. <clears throat> that's happening a little bit too. Yeah. But, but these are, these people wanted it to be fixed. Now here's the thing. Getting out is the best thing we can do. Even if the government does fall after we're gone, because what we're doing is we're making it more dangerous for our own people by being there. We've killed hundreds of thousands. We already know it. We've seen the papers. You mentioned something earlier, Brian, that I also wanted to touch on. And that's um, when you say, you, you know, you, when you see on video a mom and her kid um, getting blown up, you know, it, it might strike you as this is going to be a bad idea. Yeah. But people remember the first WikiLeaks there was a lot of blowing up civilians and laughing at them while they were hiding behind cars. Yeah. And I mean, I mean the whole Chelsea Manning leak was astounding. I mean, it was one of those where I, that shook something up in me. That's something that made me change vastly about how I saw the military because I saw this as generally idealistic people getting suckered into doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And this really, I mean, overwhelming. If you watch those videos, there's laughter there's there's enjoyment um there's there's no view that these people who are running around are living things not even and i say living things like not people like they don't even view them like dogs right. like this is it's it's literally video game stuff it's video and game. yeah it's a video game you see people blow up and you just say hey that's the video game that's what we're doing and it's just this is war this is reality of war and man uh, you know chris bangle kind of had a similar journey to me i thought that war, war was important it was something when you see evil you part of you wants to fix it and part of you says yeah i'll volunteer to go fix it or these people have volunteered to go fix it let's send them let's do it you can't with the current structure we that we have to change the structure before that can ever be a reality i would love to be a country where our government was stopping the Iger genocide and stopping the genocide in Yemen and fixing those uh, and, and fixing what's going on with all the warlords in Africa. That's not what's happening. And yeah. we need to accept that as a reality. We need to accept that as a system. We've never done this, right? This has never been why we were in Vietnam, why we were in Korea, why, you know, why, why we've been in Africa before. None of these were ever to stop these warlords. We made them worse. You have to accept from a scientific basis. You have to go hypothesis. You need to test it. You need to make observations and you need to come to a conclusion. And I want to stress that it's okay if your hypothesis is let's fix these problems by going to war. That's okay. It's not okay to ignore the testing and the observation part of the scientific method because you need to look at that and just say, we've tested it. We've seen the results. Now you have to come to a conclusion because if I, I would hope that a private militia would, would spark up and rescue some of these people who are hurting. Of course, that would involve us opening our borders on immigrants a little bit, but, uh, I mean, that's a, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Different subject there, but yeah, you know, right. I'll, I'll, I kind of said it, uh, that was a little rambly. It's everything. I just want to get out everything that I had about war. What do you, what do you got? I, you know, I I'm on, 
rapport with the Odin. I know it's supposed to be like, oh, you know, like, go, go bomb him back to the Stone Age. <laughs> They're already kind of not quite there. They're like the Bronze Age. Um, but um, the thing is that it gets back to what's the best the way to change the world. And the best way to change the world is to lead by example and give people opportunities. And um, you do those. Uh, I think if we started really, the greatest thing we could ever do in Afghanistan would be to go in there and say, you guys are really good at opium production. I mean, really good at opium production. We want to buy it from you guys because there are uses for, there are legit uses for opium. We want to buy it from you guys because you guys like fentanyl. Yeah. Wow. Which Biden's managing to screw up, by the way. Yeah. Sorry. Keep going. But there are other crops as well. We say, you know what? You do really good with opium. We'd like to see if you can do this and this. And we'll buy it from you. And I want to give you a contract that says you're going to deliver. And upon delivery, I'm going to hand you a wad of cash. Just show me that you grew it. Show me that you did it. Show me that you did all the stuff along the way. And and here's a wad of cash. And all of a sudden, people are going to be lining up going, wad of cash? Oh. <laughs> You know, forget that. Forget that guy. That's uh, you know. Kind of says that I need to send my firstborn over to blow himself up to make Allah happy. Um, but this also I, one thing I did want to touch on, Hody, your disenchantment with the military with WikiLeaks. I, I share that with you, but I took a little bit different viewpoint on. It. I, I lost all faith in mass media, the big media, the big those big companies, which should have been asking. Going, I mean, the first thing in the newsroom should have been, number one, why do I pay you guys? And number two, why aren't we covering this as like one of the top stories? They treated it, they spun it immediately as, oh, this is a serious leak. Oh, my God. You know, they treat it like treason. And I'm saying you're going, this is like Pentagon Papers on steroids, guys. Come on. You guys won Pulitzers. You get books. You get movies made. You know, we'll, we'll crack out Dustin Hoffman. You know, he'll come crashly and say, I knew I saw the, you know, I, I got the USB drive and I knew we had something. Whatever. You know, this this is this is a time for you guys to step up and be heroes in what they do. They sat there and just all over. Every single Assange, Chelsea, everybody involved in it. Um, you know, Greenwald still gets crapped on. For the Snowden stuff, which the Snowden stuff, frankly, was the A, we're not surprised, but B, should have made everybody go, wait a minute, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we keeping up on this? And, of course, there's always, you've got to check and say, look, we don't want to release this this document that accidentally names every source you have in, in Iran and gets them all hung, you know, or, or shot and their families killed. You don't want to do that, but you do also want to cover the story. And the media covered it up immediately. When I saw that, I was like, I, I'm out with them because they're on board because they don't want to lose their buddies. They don't want to lose their scoops. scoops. They they don't want to lose um, their likes. They don't want to lose all of those in, in, in rows and relationships. And it's just like what goes on with the Igers, with Yemen, with all this other stuff like that. Um, the NBA players who uh, Nike stepped up and said, look, we're not going to buy any more cotton that's from made from slave labor by Igers. Okay, great. Great. Um, you would think that the NBA would be all over that and be like, you know what, you're right. In fact, we're not going to sign – we're not going to do a shoe deal with anyone. who Make a commercial. It. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you need to pay people. Uh, you know, fair we, – we talk about fair wage and fair living, you know, fair – you know, all this stuff. Except when it comes to shoes. Shoes, we tend to just go, hey, you know what? Yeah, yeah. So one of the stories I read was Nike getting out of that. And I thought, okay, that's a good good step, you know? And the problem is going to be sourcing it because it's always tough to tell them, you know, yeah, sure, it's all non-slave labor. Or not <laughs> labor. Um, but there's an interesting thing that Nike is not one of the large – Nike's a large brand in China, but it's not the brand. There's two Chinese brands over there that not only said they're not going to stop using – Iger cotton, slave labor cotton, they're going to buy Nike's share of it and use it in their shoes. Um, do you know that NBA players also endorse those shoes? Do you know NBA players get hundreds of millions of dollars just like they get from Nike for endorsing those shoes? Yeah. Have you seen any of those NBA players go, no, we, we, we're, we're, we're done. We're not going to take that money. 
because there's some pretty big NBA players. If you look at the stories on it, it's like, I'm not going to name the names. Um, but there's some pretty big NBA players who have suddenly just gone quiet about slave cotton in coming from Igers, and they're still cashing the checks, which killed the social media thing for me a while ago with them. So in the end, it's all about money. It's all about influence. It's all about when you get to these very large groups like this and the money's just flowing in, everybody shuts up. It's like it's 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 defense, government, media. Uh, yeah. Sorry, okay, let me get the tinfoil on now for the, on the head. Um, all of these entertainment groups that just say, don't rock the boat, because if you rock the boat, seven billion people, six billion people, you know, whoever's not involved are going to say, wait a minute, time out here. Yeah. It all ends. Well, and there's and there's always been a risk. I mean, the thing with media is even from the founding of this country. Uh, I read a book called America's First Crisis, and it's a excellent book. Um, generally deals with a lot of immigration, but there's actually a ton about media in there too, and about how right off the bat, it's not like media was corrupt. You know, there's a newspaper reporting unironically, you know, that people bought and believed that George Washington had lizard parents, like was hatched from lizard people. And um, I mean, the whole way we got Alexander Hamilton's uh, papers released was um, a paper lied about him. And then Alexander Hamilton was like, all right, well, because these lies have now gotten so popular, I have to step out here and, and talk about the truth. You know, media, honestly, media has always been like, difficult because you're catering to an audience you want an audience you say something crazy you get a bigger audience even if it's wrong yeah. you know um i tend to look at guys like ben shapiro who spend 90 percent of their time talking about why you should call trans people not by their preferred pronouns and by using their dead names and I, I believe statistically it's something like he spends a quarter of his time talking about it Some, somebody actually ran the numbers on it. it was like he spends a quarter of their time talking about this now i don't believe that what goes through ben shapiro's head 25 percent of his life is that we need to dead name yeah. tr transgendered people but I think he knows his audience and I think that that's what people want. And I think that, you know, you gotta make sales. It, this is what people want to talk about. Yeah. You know, we, we, and I wouldn't say we, even we as libertarians are completely immune from it. If, I, I mean, isn't that the first rule of sales to talk about what people are talking about, right? So this is when even we on this network, I mean, we've made a commitment to talk about issues, current events, right? Like this show, we talk about current events, and then we also talk about whatever's on our mind. But we lead with a current event because that's what people are talking about. That's what people are interested in. That's what's on the news. And so I, I understand when <laughs> they're, they're, the media is like, hey, our listeners don't like hearing about this. And the thing is, is the Afghanistan papers, WikiLeaks made everybody look bad. Egg on everybody's face. I mean, we are talking about as close as you can have. Uh, uh, people want to think Obama was so different than Bush and Trump was so different than Obama and Biden was so different from Trump. Like this is as close to a, handing a baton to somebody else as it gets. I mean, it is just, it, 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 it is. And, and so when we proved it, of course, that does not fit what a lot of people want to hear. You want to believe that your favorite politicians are so much different than the other guys. There's no way they do any of that. And it's, it's just a completely different situation over there. And, and that's just not how it works. And unfortunately, like you mentioned with the WikiLeaks, it's just the mass media can't be trusted for it because they're so selling to an audience. And it doesn't, it's not a good that they want on their shelf, mm -hmm. you know, and that is unfortunate. Now, I never, I, one of the things that I've loved about We're Libertarians and this network in general and the show is that we go after those other sides of the stories. Chris recommends uh, reading other publications that are not libertarian. Right. He, he said, go out and read Vox, go out and read um, the National Review, you know, like read these other publications, know what they're talking about, you know, like don't don't get yourself in a libertarian headspace. There is such a thing as a libertarian NPC as like somebody who is brainlessly anti-government, anti this, anti that. And, and because they are anti authority has no idea what they're for, right? To them, liberty is just being against everything that's going on. And it's a, uh, it, it's a problem. 
it's it's something that I think libertarians now generally we tend to be better about it because you don't become a libertarian by following the status quo. So I'd say they're a lot less, but it's still a problem, you know, and it's still something that we have to think about and worry about. Um, cool. Well, let's move on to some peace of my mind. Um, I just yammered for a bit. So, Brian, I'll let you start with a piece of your mind first. OK, um, this is going to be the unlibertarian statist type of right winger type of viewpoint here. Ooh, delicious. I'm yeah. eager to fight with you. Um, the shooting of um, uh, the kid in Chicago. And I... The fact that you call them the kid in Chicago is not a plus for your position already. I know. I know. I know but, but please, let me, let, me, let me follow through with it. You're good. You're good. I'm just... I'm, I'm, I'm poking at you. You're good. It's Adam Toledo to anybody listening. Go ahead. Um, we, we are expecting perfection. Uh, we expect perfection in a lot of things. We expect 99.999% of stuff to get right all the time. And that one, one, one thousandth of a percent that doesn't end up right gets uh, scorned. And we, we want to be better. We always want to be better. We want to do things better. Um, the reality is, is that we are never going to do things perfect as, as humanity, um, input, output, algorithms, whatever you want to do. Somebody's still designing it. Somebody's still going to make a mistake. We still blow up the occasional space shuttle. We still have a plane crash. We still make a, a poor choice on building a bomb and, and bombing out a daycare. Um, the reality is, is that we get better when we ask questions on why something tragic happened. And, and this is the, the Toledo shooting as well. Find out why it happened. And, and be able to ask questions across the board, not victim blame, because that's that's the one key point I kind of want to make on this. Uh, there's been a lot of jump uh, from a lot of libertarian and uh, anti-status people, understandably. Kid had his hands up, shouldn't have made the shot. If you watch the video, the kid had his hands up and the shot was already being fired. The decision-making process had already been made um, because, uh, and I can't get in the cop's head at the time, but if you watch the video, um, it, it looks like the kid is throwing the BB gun and yes, it was a BB gun, but it wasn't clearly marked, you know, like Fred's BB gun. Uh, it looked like a, a weapon that was used just a few minutes earlier shooting up a car. So a split second decision is made. Uh, was it terrible? Absolutely. Uh, was a frame grab made where its hands were up and, uh, the bullet was being fired? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And the picture looks terrible, but you have to watch the whole video. Um, and you never will for a lot of people because honestly, it is very disturbing. Um, I'm not defending the cop in this. I think we have to have due process in this. I think we need to have an investigation, uh, preferably not by somebody that's involved with the police department, you know, just somebody that's going to take a legit look at this. I think we have to ask questions on why this happened. Uh, what could have been done differently? Uh, I am not going to jump on the, uh, they shouldn't, no kid should ever die bandwagon because if that's the case i'm locking them all at home oh wait they're gonna die there too guess what we've seen upticks in child abuse with covid uh okay so uh we're gonna make sure that they go to a school oh look they're gonna die going to school and being on the bus you know we can't live in a zero accidental death world uh we'd like to get there and i i think we're getting better at it but there's always gonna be something new and something tragic happens uh i'm not dismissing it and I think we can get better at it. But I think also taking a frame grab and, and using it as a rally cry of either defund the police or all cops are bastards or whatever you want to call it is disingenuous. Um, I understand I understand the anger. I understand that, that people should be mad at the situation, but I think we also need to take a step back and say, let's be mad at the situation, not the people in it until we get a full review of it. Derek Chauvin, the, trying to compare this to Derek Chauvin, what he did, um, is, is disingenuous. Uh, what Derek Chauvin did, uh, clearly documented, um, there may have been circumstances there. Uh, I don't know if it'll lead to reasonable doubt. I don't think it will, judging by the case that I've seen. Um, but I'm not in the jury, and I don't have the pressures that they do. Um, we just basically have to allow due process to work its way through. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty. Uh, no matter how much the media and everybody else likes to jump on board and uh, be uh, judges and things like that. But we also have to be able to ask the hard questions. Why is the kid out? What were they doing? Can we change that so that doesn't happen? So we don't get to that situation. 
plenty of things to look at on the police side to say they can do different, plenty of things that can be done also on the parenting side. I can't imagine letting my three-year-old run around at three o'clock in the morning, but of course I didn't grow up in that situation. So that's, that's my piece of my mind. I know it's kind of a little statist view there, <laughs> but I, I here, here's uh, issues that I have. Now I agree. I'm not, I'm not searching for perfection. I do have, as you said, the decision had already been made. Um, do you remember offhand what the cop said before he fired? Get your, put your hands up. And he was in the process of putting his hands up. Get your fucking. Yeah. Yeah. Hands up. Okay. And, 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 you know, it's kind of one of those things where you're just, where, where you've got the adrenaline going and you're running. I, I have said, get your bleeping thing out of your hand or whatever to a kid of mine. I, I, I've said stuff like that when you're in anger and you're running and the adrenaline and they just hit him with the dazzler. Uh, if you saw it just before, which I actually think that's the biggest contributor to this whole situation, besides him being out and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. About when they're running down and they put the light on, you see it strobes like crazy, and you can see the kids disoriented by it. If you ever have one of those strobes go off in your face, it's it 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 stuns you. It it momentarily stuns you, but it also makes it tough to your brain's processing what's all this going on. And all of a sudden, you're telling him to, to, to get your effing hands up, and he's got the word with all the gold and throw the gun behind him, which is fine. I mean, that's, you know, I, I don't agree with that. I wish he would have just sat there, put his hands up, the cops find the BB gun, and go, oh, it was a BB gun. Dumbass. Um, that's what the cop would say, not saying the kid was a dumbass. That's I, I know what the cop would say. He already said, hands, so. keep digging, Brian. You're keep good. Fucking mess. <laughs> Make my point for me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but, there's a lot of things, but that's the thing is being able to go back and ask those questions and it's tragic. It's horrible. Um, not only watching the video, but watching the cops reaction afterwards, it wasn't a, you know, I've seen plenty of videos where they shoot a guy, cuff him. And then they sit there and talk about weather for five minutes, waiting for the guy to bleed out. So, I mean, he immediately went in and said, Hey, you know, he didn't cuff the kid. He started doing CPR, trying to get help, you know, radioed in saying that the police shot, you know, fired shots. Because if they would have said shots fired, what happens is they will secure the scene before the ambulance comes in. There's there's a little difference there. If you say the police shot, that there's no return fire, the ambulances will come right in. Sure. So, and, right. And I, I would say I haven't seen somebody compare it to Derek Chauvin, but had I done so, yeah, that's a it's a <laughs> very different situation here. I do think here's the thing. If you make these decisions because of the heat of the moment. You should not be a police officer. That's a, I agree with what you're saying, Brian, because I think a lot of us get stressed out in that type of scenario. Like you said, like with your kid or things are going around and you're overwhelmed and you're freaking out, right? This needs to be a job that is only for people who are very calm under pressure, who are very measured, who, uh, um, what if, so, if you tell somebody to get their hands up and they put their hands up, you shouldn't shoot. Right. And this is, again, he's allowing, I think it's very relatable. I get what your point is taken that it's very relatable because I, I understand what he's going through. It was very quick. It was very like, you can imagine if you're looking for somebody, you know, they're armed and dangerous. You see somebody with a gun, they make a quick motion. You know, I, I get that. But if they make a motion that responds to your commands, even if it's a quick one, this this cannot be a game of Simon Says. And ultimately, the, there are d jobs that we have in this country that are great for people who get overwhelmed when there's too much pressure. Um, police officers are not one of them. I and and this is the and and I think this is it. Is we talk about reform, and we've spent oodles and oodles more money on reform, and oodle and and yet these types of things are still happening. And I think what needs to happen in the libertarian perspective, we have to simplify our laws. We have to cut down on the number of these interactions and we have to cut down the way in which they're dealt with here in Salt Lake city. Um, we actually had a real severe problem with cops shooting suspects and suspects shooting cops. We added a de-escalation course to the officer program. Now I haven't checked this statistic recently, but since it was implemented, we actually had, I mean, at least for a few years, I remember we had a few years worth of data at least, but no cops had killed any civilians and no civilians had killed any cops. It was actually better for both sides. De-escalation training is very important. Sorry, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, no, it's it, amazing how when you 
aren't pointing guns at each other, people don't shoot each other. Uh, um, right. <laughs> uh, Mary Rewart calls this the good uh, neighbor policy, right? If, if, if nobody's striking first, there is no fight, you know? And so this is uh, one of the things that I did want to bring up as well is Brianna Taylor. Um, we haven't seen, unfortunately, the body cams didn't work out very well. Um, How did that happen? Isn't that surprising? It turned off? Wow. <laughs> but yeah. we actually have a body camera footage of a different raid of those same officers. Yeah. Um, raiding a different home. Here's the problem. They used the F word four times before they said, we're the police, come downstairs. They busted down a door and started, they busted the door. And again, four different people yelled some iteration of the F word among like whatever, before they said the word police. So when right. we talk about how Brianna Taylor's boyfriend shot first and you see these cops and how they perform in a raid, if somebody busts into my door right now and I have a gun here and they start being like, I'm going to fuck you all up or whatever. You're just like, oh, oh my gosh, that's, Ah, right? Like this is what it is. And so this is the problem is, is this is not done in a way that advocates de-escalation. This is another problem with government. They have no incentive to do it. These are not their lives. These are your kids' lives. These aren't their kids' lives. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, when there's these public school shootings, look, their kids <laughs> are, uh, I believe a public sector employee is eight times more likely to enroll their kid in a private school than a public sector. They don't care what's going on in your public yeah. schools. Oh. Right? That's not their kids. That's your kids. Yeah. You know? It's the plebs. And it, it's funny how that changes people, seeing people in the education system, how much they put their kids in private education because they care. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, that's sad and terrible. But I think COVID maybe is proving that point pretty plainly, especially with the schools that refuse to open. I, I honestly, I am hoping this is the beginning of the end of mandatory public schools and that we'll see school choice just blossom across the country because it's now, I mean, you have to have a heck of a, you have to have a heck of a uh, bit of pretzel logic to get to, Oh, well they kept, you know, Oh, well, okay. If we, if we put the safety things in place, then we can go back to school. Well, now we want our teachers to be vaccinated. And so once they're vaccinated, we'll open up the doors. Well, now we want the kids to be vaccinated. Well, well, now we want boats and we want the really nice boats. Don't cheap out on, we want the leather. Um, it, it just, it keeps going down and down. And what do people say? After a year and a half of this, of this type of education process, either you're, you're really good at teaching your kids and realizing how poorly they're teaching them in school, uh, or you're sitting here going, you know what, I, I, I'll just put them in a private school. And of course, when that happened, when they suddenly saw the spike in private school enrollment, the state came in. Oh, you can't do that! You can't! You can't do that! Oh, watch me! Um, you do it. <laughs> yeah, do it in a heartbeat. Yeah, I, I, I would love. I would love, and it's of course goes against privacy laws just to go out and say, okay, if you enroll your kids in a private school and you're a public employee, you have to report that. Just, just, just flip a bit. Just flip a bit. We won't track you name like that. But just, just don't do surveys. Let's actually make it a requirement of employment. If you throw your kid in private school, it's fine. You can go right ahead. Don't, don't include college. College is a different story. But flip that bit and let's see how many kids are in private schools. Let's see how many kids are uh, in schools outside of their district, the district that they live in. <laughs> right. It's it's a segregation based on class and based on location. And that okay. is bad stuff. Um yeah, I, pr I appreciate that. It is it is a different uh, it is different. Again, this officer should be treated much differently than Derek Chauvin. Like you said, he was immediately remorseful. I still believe he is accountable for his actions. Yeah. I still believe that there needs to be an amount of. I, I don't think we should hold water to people who don't deserve our water. I think um, he made a he made a bad mistake when somebody followed his orders, and it's like that is it. It, it is hard to see. It's, uh, it's, it, it, there are worse shootings, oh, but yeah. this, but you know, like, I, and, and so I think that's your point here is like, this is, it's hard because I think as libertarians, we have to pick and choose our battles. We can't fight every single one. And I guess this is, that might be one of the tougher ones just because of how quickly it happened. We don't want to create a false narrative. Even so, I do think it is fair to, I think it is a fair point of information to say like, this is, 
this is a cop, right? Who, yeah. No problem uses ex using expletives. Kid does what he said. Yes, he does it quickly. Still pops him. Yes, something. He's got too much adrenaline. He's racing. He made a mistake. Well, I, yeah, he, I think he realized he made a mistake. I think the yeah. question is, is this guilt? Is this is this manslaughter or is this something you know where you kind of get in that fuzzy area of justifiable shooting? Do I? If using expletives is is a is a uh, a, a, a you're not going to be able to be hired by a police force. We're going to have so many Mormons on the police force. So yes. <laughs> right, I, I, I bring it up purely because of de-escalation. I mean, obviously, when you're using a swear word, you're escalating the situation. That's the only reason I bring. I'm not demanding everybody wears magic underpants. I just want to make that clear right now. I I I, I get it. I, I think the expletives have turned have turned and uh, become pretty commonplace. I, yeah. I, I I don't see the expletives. What I do see is, um, what can we do better? And that's yeah. what it comes down to is what can we do better? I don't think this guy wants to. I, I'm looking probably too much into this, but judging by his reaction afterwards, not only trying to get the CPR but sitting down afterwards, and just seeing that adrenaline come off. Mm -hmm. It's going to be impossible to have somebody who's like that 24 seven. I think the greatest thing that fixes all of this is body cameras. Um, I think this opens up the world yep. to see what goes on. Um, I do think that anyone who sits there and screams in the media that they need to go ahead and uh, he needed to do a better job of knowing that was a BB gun. I think those people need to take the courses that they teach these officers which be able to identify a BB gun and a real gun and be able to do it in less than a quarter. Well, that's what the orange tip means. Oh. oh, you mean he didn't have the orange tip on that? <laughs> oh, how, oh, naughty kid. He took the orange tip off. Oh, I'm sorry you got shot. Um, I would actually like to see one thing because the taser would have been ineffective. Um, the kid was sure. bundled up and stuff like that. So, I mean, the taser hits the clothes, does nothing. I would love to see, and it's tough to find the science on it, um, if you had a weapon that could, you know, a smaller grain, because that thing just went right through and he was gone, unfortunately, immediately. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe do something different. But that's, these are the questions that we should ask. These are the questions right. we should sit down, sit down with the police, the, the experienced ones, the ones that we want to listen to, not the guys that sit there and go, we got a tank. We're going to go get all <laughs> the drug dealers and sold dollars a pot. Um, those are the ones. And there's lots of them out there. And that's where I also get to is that not, I, I really have a hard time with ACE ACAP because if, you, if you're going to say all cops are bastards, guess what? You're going to breed an entire group of people who say, oh, we're all, we're all bastards. It's like what they said when libertarians were like uh, checked on today. So that uh, said Republicanism and, and libertarianism has brought racism into the national. And I'm just like going. Is Chuck Todd really a know what he's talking about? You know, if you're called a racist and have nothing based on it, you're going to think you're either stupid or you're an asshole. I'm pretty sure it's both. Um, but that's exactly what's going to happen in this case. You get people to tune out and go, eh, I don't want to talk to you. You think we're all evil. Yeah, it's it's this is something that I felt for a while. And I I, I believe the police force was probably my last libertarian domino to fall um, yeah. for me personally. And the reason being, is, and, and I still feel this way a little bit, is because I, I do feel that much like if we give if we give the same excuse to military members, they were young, they are idealistic, they didn't know better. I mean, there's I mean, and this goes department by department, but they have an IQ test where they actually have a maximum yeah. that police officers can test. <laughs> so you can't be too smart and be a cop. Um, that Again, that's that's district by district. It's not every precinct. I don't, I don't want everybody thinking that that happens, but it, it does happen. And so that's, that's concerning. Um, and so what they are doing is intentionally preying upon people that follow orders that don't have a will of their own. They're looking for these people. And I don't believe, I think like you, and this is maybe where it'd be nice to have Aaron on the show, but, like, but like you, I'm kind of with you that I think that calling them all bastards is not going to help. Um, it's like saying like, here's the thing. Were all the Nazis at fault and responsible for their actions. Yes, they were. Like, I, I don't believe in the Nuremberg defense. You know, you, you have to be accountable for what you do. At the same time, I'm not going to pretend that somebody that had more people called the Nazis bastards, that there would be, that Nazism wouldn't have worked out. Like, it's just, 
<laughs> that's not exactly how that that works, right? Like, and we want to do something that's tactful, right? And so instead of appealing to be like you're when you tell somebody who doesn't feel they're doing the wrong thing, that they're evil to the core, that they're racist, that they're bastards, that they're they they're, they tune you out. You know what I mean? And and we already know it might be wrong, but we already know if, if our goal is to actually fix it, then we can't galvanize them. Right. And we know how, how galvanization works. One of my biggest problems with like the Kaepernick protest was, wasn't that, yes, it was peaceful. Um, he should have been allowed to do it. A lot of people were like, make him stand up. I know this is one that might not make me popular among a lot of libertarians, but my problem is what was the effect? Well, what happened was we had something like 180 body cam laws on the record, like go across the nation in different districts and locals and all 180 of them got dropped. Yeah. Because they're just like, well, we're not going to, we hate this guy. We're not going to, now that shouldn't be the, that, I, and this is why I bring it up. That shouldn't be the case, right? That's not like good people shouldn't do the wrong thing just because somebody else made them mad. But unfortunately we live in the real world and this is how it works. So you might not like it, but yeah, like we do have to be tactful. You might think yelling all cops are bastards is making their last. I, I had a friend on Facebook who claimed he was the Dallas sniper and was like, pretty soon we're going to have killed so many cops that nobody's going to apply here anymore. They're running out, they're running low. And <laughs> he was an idiot. He wasn't even the sniper because the sniper got caught and he was still around. And like, I mean, and the thing is, is they're not running out. Like it's just, they, they prey on to, And so what it is, you need to address the system without demonizing human beings. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Okay see why they were sinning what sin took place and understand that it's not it's okay to ask the big questions right get out why did they use the dazzler why did they pull the trigger why was he shooting why was the uh, the kid and the other and the guy that's 21 years old who by the way did get charged with child endangerment and said it wasn't his fault that he got shot even though he was dragging the kid around and shot up a car just you know like a minute and a half earlier it wasn't his fault yeah there's uh, there's yeah, we have to measure these effects. Uh, uh, we have actually, there are instances, we talked about this on the program, we have the, we have certain areas that have privatized their police departments. Yeah. And here's what happened. Cop wages doubled. Yeah. Number of cops pretty much halved. Yeah. Response times cut in half. Yeah. Effectiveness increased. And the Supreme Court ruled that they are accountable for their people's safety, whereas a public the police department is not. What was the priorities of these police officers? Well, what they started on was open murder mysteries and rape kits, right? What hey. did they not prioritize when their own, because their own city is paying for them and contracting them out, right? It's still not the perfect free market, I get it. But what happened? They stopped policing roads and they started policing rape and murder, right? right. And so, and, and here, the reason I bring all this up is because who was a big fan of this? Good cops really liked this system and so when we go around saying all cops are bastards as opposed to sharing the system be like listen here's closer to where i envision it is you going out solving murders rapes theft stopping people from stealing stuff like this is what i want to see you doing here's what i don't want to see you doing you know road piracy you know petty petty crimes you know and, and here's all this and it increases the quality of what you get. And this is, and so it's good for the people, but it's good for the cops too. And I think it's an appeal that we should make to cops. Now, if it's a bad cop, they're going to hear it and they're going to know that they're one of the half of the cops that got cut, right? Oh. They hear this system and they're going to be like, oh, they're going to double our pay, but there's going to be less than half is left. Well, that's going to be me because I'm a bad cop. Why don't you do the steroid thing then at that point? Hey, look, we find some guy that's embezzling and doing all this stuff. If we catch you doing it, you're all fired. You're yeah. All everything and and then they'll self-police a lot better all of a sudden going because we had we had that actually happen here where a guy was embezzling from the from the police action league he's embezzling cat uh, tons of cash no charges filed amazing um what do people think of that when that happens oh look they're gonna be corrupt damn and then nothing you can do because it's the public that got stolen from and you as an individual and not the public. Stupid. Anyhow, my thing, and this is a good segue from this, uh, my piece of my mind, the trial of Derek Chauvin is going on. It's one of the few times I love when they do this. I love when they have a camera in the courtroom and we actually get to see it. It requires both sides kind of agreeing to it. 
which is pretty amazing. And so it happens very rarely. Most of the time, you know, we, we, we hear, you know, I, I still remember the OJ case where they had to hold not guilty up as like a paper against the door. And, you know, we don't get to see all these big moments um, that sometimes happen. Uh, or the John Benet Ramsey is another one. You didn't get to see any of that. Um, but I did want to talk. Um, his defense was astoundingly terrible. And I, and there's a lot of tinfoil hat going around this about why it was so bad. Cause some people think like maybe they threw it so that he could get convicted and they could appeal the conviction or that like, you know, because they like are planning on appeal because like his own defense team was incompetent. If you watched it, it is striking. And, and I'm just telling you this straight up because this is something Jamie and I, so we we've went into it and watched it together. We did not know going into this, we did not believe he would be convicted. We just thought there's two, you have to know what's going through his head. There's just no way. Like, it's just impossible. And afterwards, I mean, even in, there was somebody who even came out today, one of the uh, experts for uh, in Minnesota there, and was just like, I mean, unless somebody is really, really biased and just will not vote guilty no matter what, I don't see how there's any way he avoids at least guilty on something, right? On at least the manslaughter charge. And that's kind of where Jamie and I left it too. Like, there's just... It, w- it went as bad as you can imagine it going. Now, the reason I feel this is important to talk about, and this is something that I kind of learned w- after like uh, Ahmaud Arbery, right? Like, he, you know, when, and he was the one who got hit by the car and shot and went because he was jogging in that neighborhood and he went through an abandoned house or whatever. And the thing is, is there was a lot of excuses made for why he got shot. And it, it, you know what? Be skeptical. We're libertarians. We're all skeptical of everything, okay? Be skeptical on what you see on the surface. But after you find out they called him the N-word, after you find out that a bunch of people go through that abandoned house, after you find out that, you know, there, there was no reported robbery, and after you find, like, all these, at some point you have to be like, okay, I need to stop. I need to stop being on this position no matter what and start accepting some evidence. So in the case of Derek Chauvin, there are a select group of libertarians that were like, eh, that's a shame, but really, you know, it, it, it was probably the drugs that killed him. It was probably meth that killed him. It was pro- You know what? If he didn't want to do that, he shouldn't have been carrying forged bills. The reason I encourage people people to watch these trials is because you should not make an excuse that Derek Chauvin didn't believe and his defense also didn't believe because that just means you were making up something. And, and, and you know what, maybe you didn't make it up, but you believed the narrative that somebody made up and said, you know what, that's what I'm going with. Because what happened was, is any, all these excuses that people had for why Derek Chauvin had to kneel on his neck for nine minutes and 45 seconds. All, all, all these reasons, you know, that were, that were, and ultimately what did the defense go with? The crowd kind of scared him and he lost track of time. <laughs> that is, that was the defense. That was the leading defense. Now, later on, they kind of realized that that wasn't really doing well with the jury. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and so they ended up like they got into the autopsy and then they had the guy uh, like, so there's the two autopsies, right. And the one autopsy that was like, Oh, it might be drug drug contributed to it. Right. And then they had the other guy get up and he's like, right. But even in that autopsy, while the drugs were a contributing factor, the ultimate death was still lack of air. That's how this gets brought on. Right. That's how this death gets brought on. Okay. And then they brought somebody else to be like uh, what their final defense was. Well, maybe it wasn't Derek Chauvin cutting off his oxygen. Maybe, maybe George Floyd was being held too close to the car exhaust. Okay. Who do you think was holding him under the car exhaust? And he told you repeatedly he couldn't breathe it needed air. So the reason I bring this up is because it is, it's hard to change your mind. I was, I was not sure initially as well. I watched a video. I watched a second video. I, I, I do believe, look, the media is biased. You're just going to have to deal with that. It is. Was he less than forthcoming about getting in the car? Was he not like, oh, sure, yeah, let's hop in the police vehicle, of course, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Was that hid by the media? Yes, it was. And we have two types of media. One that's like, here's the real George Floyd. Here's the real George Floyd. He's just a person. Okay. People want to show these pictures of him. Like here's him with a gun. Here's him robbing a pregnant lady. You know, here's, this is the, I I found it. This is the real George Floyd. 
And then people are like, well, here's him donating his time and money. And here's him, you know, trying to turn his life around. This is the real George Floyd. Can't the real George Floyd just be all that? Like, you got to take in all the information. Now, that being said, if you were on the side of, of Derek Chauvin did nothing wrong, your defense, whatever legitimate defense you think you had, was not what the, his own defense team went with. Is not what even he believed. What they went with is he lost track of time because the crowd was kind of scary and, <laughs> and, le and kneeled on his neck for too long. That's the best they had. And that's why I, lo I love watching these because I think for me, it reveals more than because we, we all want to have an opinion, right? We all jump to have an opinion. It, it's fun to have opinions. I, I don't blame anybody for that, but you need to refine your opinion when something like this comes up. And, and when you see a, a case like this, that goes that I mean, this was South for the defense. I mean, this was, there are times when, I mean, law and order and, you know, amateurs who've watched three episodes of law and order would be like uh, objection. They're, shouldn't the defense object right now? This is really bad. Like what's, what's happening. And they, and they just didn't, and it just fell apart for him. I don't quite have the tinfoil hat on to think that they threw it. I've, I've kind of heard the, the rumors, but it, it looked thrown <laughs> for whatever it's worth. It looked very bad. And um, I, I don't know if there's another rumor that because of course the public is providing this defense that perhaps the public wanted him to lose. <laughs> then that way they get rid yeah. of the rights. These are tinfoil hat theories. I'm just throwing these out there. I'm just saying it was really bad. And if you believed any dumb story about, I, I don't want to call it dumb. They look legitimate. If you believed a story that didn't bear, that didn't hold water, let it go. You know, just be like, okay, you know what? Now I have more information. My girlfriend actually hadn't seen the video, the full video before the trial. And after seeing the video and watching it and what the what the pedestrians were saying, she was like, oh yeah, that's that's murder. That's what that's what murder looks like. Okay, and yeah, um, yeah. yeah. go ahead, Brian. It's definitely man too. I I I, I always said that the. the and I think what they're trying to make on their cornerstone here is is trying to get um, percentage of guilt and reasonable and, and any sort of reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, percentage of guilt, government loves to say, "Hey, if we're if you're one percent responsible for this, you're one hundred percent responsible as far as the government's concerned." So that's the that's the threshold they think they're doing. Uh, number two is just getting somebody in there to go. Well, you know, with all the circumstances and things like that. And that's where it kind of gets into this whole thing of, well, he lost track of time. And can you make a reasonable, you know, concern that, that he was really afraid and things like that with all the police around him and this crowd growing, saying, hey, what you're doing is awful and you should stop doing that? Um, George, George Floyd should still be alive. Um, he may have died at the hospital if he did have a drug issue, but that should have been done at the hospital, not with Derek Chauvin kneeling on his neck. Um, I, I, the two police officers I've spoken to just briefly about this, uh, both of them were kind of horrified by it, um, personally, um, that, that they wouldn't do that because they know that's going to end up very poorly for, for whoever that's in custody. I think it does get to that. If the, if the police have in custody, they're responsible for your safety. Um, but that's not happening. And that's why I think this defense is all made on, is that we don't have to take care of you. Um, if you contributed at all to your own demise, it's entirely on you. Mm -hmm. And I'll prove one way or another that somewhere the the myriad of possibilities that this was just a bad situation that got worse. Uh, it's a little harder. It's a little bit easier to make it with the Toledo shooting. Um, it's a little bit harder with Derek Chauvin kneeling on his neck for as long as he did. So, I, you know, I, I, I don't see a... I, I, when I saw this when they first went after murder, I thought, oh, God, you, you, you're getting into some easily equitable areas because you can overcharge and the jury can go, that's definitely manslaughter. I, you know, murder, you've got even secondary, third degree murder, you've got to have some yeah. plenty in here. Um, it's and, nice that it is Minnesota where they're allowed to charge for all of it because yeah. most places you actually have to charge for one thing, go for that thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's why I think they would have went manslaughter, but I think that's why they, they threw murder in there. I honestly still think it's going to be manslaughter. Um, no it's, one will be happy with it. No one will be happy with the, with the outcome. I don't see, and honestly, I feel bad for the jurors in this, because no matter what decision they make, 
it's going to ruin their, I mean, I'm not going to say ruin their lives. It's going to follow them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Um, no matter what the decision, the easy kind of layup decision is guilty on everything, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I don't think it's the right decision to say murder two, probably man two. Um, which is why I said, you know, eh, yeah, I get the whole thing. And my position changed a little bit because when I heard about the drugs, I was like, well, was he unconscious when he put his, was he already out? <laughs> you know, or was right. he, you know, but um, no, it's, and watching as limited of the defense that I have, I, I'm just shaking my head going, this guy's <laughs> never going to get a job again. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I was even trying to like get the scoop on the defense lawyers, like going into this to be like, wh wh what's their angle at it? I couldn't find enough about them to, to kind of establish like if this is like a common tactic that they use or something. I mean, there really was no tactic. So I bring up um, like George Zimmerman and Casey Anthony are two teams where like they might be guilty. They might like America was kind of like, Oh my gosh, like what the heck happened here? And their defense teams crafted a story. It was believable. They got the jurors at least one, all you got to get is at least one juror. Right. And so you get at least one juror to believe it. And you say, okay, you know what? Like this is the story. This is what we're going with. And this is what we want people to feel strongly about. And, you know, I've watched those, you know, and, and the defense is there just, they did a great job. And so if you want to see what like a great defense look like, looks like, like, and, and I don't want to anger people by saying there's no way Casey Anthony killed her kid. And there's no way George Zimmerman was not up to malicious activity when he tracked down Trayvon Martin. Okay. But this is what, it, this is what a good defense does, right. Is, is gets their client to look as good as possible. I mean, these people made Derek Chauvin. They look, he looked inept and then he looked like, I mean, they tried to make him like he was really scared which is why he was ready to mace the people that were asking if the guy was okay. And I'm like, Oh, that doesn't make you look better. Like this is his hands were in his pocket. Cause he was casual. His hands were in his pocket. Cause he was ready to mace the people who were asking if George Floyd was still breathing. It didn't like just a step backwards where he liked it. When you practice this, what did it sound like? <laughs> was there, I, I put together some sketches in, in like, you know, for, for, um, you know, my local playhouse before, and I don't think any of them have gone that far south. That is, it, it was bad. Um, it's bad all around. But. Yeah. Anyhow, guys, war is bad. Murdering people's bad. Um, I, I wish we had Aaron V here. Poor guy got held up at work, I guess, uh, because I'm sure he would have a different take on murder and war, right? Being bad? No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> he'd probably be a little more heavy on the ACAB stuff, uh, which uh, w w maybe that'll be a nice uh, debate for some time, but uh, I appreciate you all turning in, tuning in. Thank you so much. Uh, share the show if you like it. Brian, I appreciate it. I know this takes a lot for you. Appreciate you talking with me tonight. And I'll, I'll catch you next week. Thanks, everybody.